And so we'll bring Father Gruner back to the microphone that he can spend the remainder of the time uh, talking to us about the power and the importance of the brown scapula. Uh, one thing I'd like to mention, Father Simich, if I pronounce your name correctly, Father, has given you all a copy of a resolution he's proposing, and I spoke to him in the break, and I thought it was a great idea. I just thought that we could take a paragraph C of his resolve resolution that we don't need to create a separate entity for Father Gruner's apostolate for the simple reason, perhaps many of you don't know this, and although we brought our office manager from our Indian office, and I thought we would have our Philippine office manager here, he apparently couldn't make it, but we also have an office in Rome. And uh, in fact, we're literally a stone's throw away from the Vatican. You can walk down the stairs to the front door and if you've got a good arm, you can actually hit the Vatican wall from where our office is. Um, this, so we do have an office in the Vatican. We have, uh, not in the Vatican, I don't wish to be saying in any latitude, it's actually in the city of Rome, but it's next to the Vatican City. And uh, we certainly intend to be promoting the Green Scapular in Rome the next year when they expect some 24 million visitors. And so uh, we could, and if somebody wanted to donate for the cause of having green scapulars and material about the green scapular printed in various languages as we give out the green scapular, uh, we were able to hand, handle that. We've given out in Rome, I think, close to a million flyers and so forth it with very limited effort on our part. So it's not that hard to do uh, for someone, for some group our size. So I just, since this will be perhaps this resolution we'll discuss tomorrow, uh, I'm sure those that, if they're not here, they can certainly send, hand in their subscription. That is the right, they, they, they agree with this idea and we can count that as part of their vote tomorrow. And the other thing about the resolutions, the resolutions of the Mexico conference, if you're not here tomorrow, you can always say you agree with them. They're on chapter 15 of Fatima Priest, 14 Fabulous Footsteps Forward. Uh, and, uh, but there will be no doubt some other uh, things as well. But anyway, to tell you about the, Greens, the Brown Scapular and the prayer, if you listen to the prayers carefully, you will find echoes right from Sacred Scripture and Our Lady's promise about the Brown Scapular. The, the Scapular goes back to the time of the Old Testament, the time of Elias the prophet. Elias had prayed to God for a drought that is, that there be no rain, because the people uh, of God at that time, as in other times in human history, were not listening very carefully. So Elias wanted to get their attention. And one of the ways, of course, we're all rather sensitive to is when our stomachs are empty, we, we get the point, something's wrong. Well, he prayed for there to be no rain, and so for three and a half years, there was no rain. You can read this in the Book of Kings, uh, whether, it's, I think it's the third or the fourth book of Kings, um, or the first or the second, depending how you number your Bible. The point is that you'll find this in Scripture, and I can give you the references, but I don't have them at my memory. But Elias prayed for there to be no rain. And so he was on Mount Carmel. So it's not for nothing that Our Lady's called Our Lady Mount Carmel. He was on Mount Carmel, and he prayed in his hermitage for rain. After three and a half years of no rain, he had had their attention, so he decided to ask God now to send rain. So he prayed, and he had his assist uh, associate, whose name escapes me, and he would send this man down Mount Carmel, down to the sea. Go and see if any rain is coming. So the man went down the mountain and looked at the sea, and he saw no rain. So he came back up the mountain. So Elias prayed again. Elias sent him down the mountainside again, and again he was told, no rain. He did this six times, and six times Elias's prayer was not answered. Six times there was no rain. So Elias prayed a seventh time. The man went down the mountainside, he got to the sea, the saltwater sea, and he saw a little cloud coming out of the sea. This cloud was in the shape of a foot, and this cloud grew and grew and grew until it covered the whole land. And the man ran and ran and ran to get back up to Elias to tell him that rain was coming. Elias understood that God was saying something in this cloud in the shape of a foot. It was from that one cloud that the rain fell on the whole land. 
the cloud was in the shape of a foot, and the cloud rose out of the saltwater sea. The doctors of the church have pointed out there are three Marian privileges symbolized in that one cloud. Elias certainly understood that the cloud referred to Our Lady herself. He knew sacred scripture. He knew that it was the woman who had crushed the serpent's head and that the foot represented that woman's foot. And so from that moment on, Elias, on Mount Carmel, founded a group of hermits to prepare for the coming of the Savior and for the coming of the Savior's mother. So Elias, I believe, lived some 700 years or maybe a bit more before the coming of Christ. And that community of hermits living on Mount Carmel after the coming of our Lord became a group of hermits in honor of Our Lady and Our Lord. And they lived in the Holy Land until 1241. It was that year that the successor of Elias, the superior general of the Carmelite order, St. Simon's Dock, transferred the Carmelite foundation to England to a little town or village in Kent, in Aylesford. Aylesford is the name of the town and Kent is the name of the county about 35 miles from London. Uh, I have lived in Aylesford for about various times for four months or so between 1964 and 1965. It was there, tradition, Carmelite tradition holds that it was at Aylesford, although some other Carmelites might hold another city in England that Our Lady appeared, that Our Lady came to St. Simon's Dock as he was praying to her for difficulties of the order at the time. Our Lady came and touched his mantle, and I should tell you a little bit about his mantle, and said, whoever dies clothed in this mantle or the scapular will not suffer eternal fire. I forgot to mention to you that Elias wore a mantle. A mantle is something like a priest's stole. It's a little different though. It's got a hole in the middle. It's about 10 inches wide and it goes down to the knees and the front and the back. And this mantle was a sign of Saint uh, of Elias's prophetic authority. So you also read in the book of Kings that when Elias wanted to cross the river Jordan. He took his mantle off, touched the river. It stopped flowing, and he walked across without getting his feet wet. And when he went up to heaven in the fiery chariot, his succeeding prophet, Eliseus, asked him for his prophetic authority. And Elias said to him, if, you, if I leave behind my mantle when I go, know that you've received my prophetic authority. So when the fiery chariot came down from heaven and picked him up, Elias left behind his mantle, and Eliseus received his prophetic authority. So the mantle, the, the, the stole of a priest is a symbol of his priestly authority, and the mantle of Elias was a symbol of his prophetic authority. And so what a scapular is, is a cut-down version of the mantle. If you concede a, a mantle that is worn over the shoulders, one part in front, one part in the back, that is what a scapular is. It's the same thing, except it's much smaller. And so it's worn over the shoulders, as you see, and it's, it is that you're putting yourself under Our Lady's mantle. When you wear the scapular, you put yourself under her protection. Our Lady came and said to St. Simon Stock, receive this scapular. It shall be a sign of salvation, a protection in danger, and a pledge of peace. Whosoever dies clothed in this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. So you have Our Lady's promise both for this world and for the next. She says it will be a sign of salvation, a protection in danger, and a pledge of peace. I remember meeting several people. I've enrolled I guess several hundred thousand people in the scapular over the years. I remember being in a school not far from here. I think it was uh, Port Colberg or Port Hope or some smaller city uh, on the other side of Toronto. And I enrolled all the school children that day when I was speaking with the statue in the parish that day. 
And one mother that evening came back to the ceremonies in honor of Our Lady and wanted to talk to me. She was very grateful. She said, thank you for enrolling my son in the scapular. Well, I guess I did something. I'm, I'm not minimizing the enrollment in the scapular, but I hardly expected to be thanked for it. It's just part of, the mes part of a message, and I appreciated her remarks. But she insisted. She said, no, I really want to thank you. So she wanted to tell me what happened to her son after I enrolled him in the scapular. She took him home, put him in the back seat of the car, and drove off down the highway. She went around a corner, and I guess in her hurry, or whatever it was, she didn't close the door very well. Her son rolled out. On the highway. So when she realized what happened, she went back to pick him up. She expected him to be cut or bruised or something worse. She found him without any scratch at all. I met a man when I first met John some years ago near Washington at a talk that we were both invited to give, different talks. There was a man there from Washington who wanted to tell me about his experience with the Brown scapular. He said as he was driving down the highway, somebody from somewhere threw a rock at him coming in the window. He had knocked the glasses out of his pocket onto the seat beside him, the passenger seat. He didn't think much of it, he just kept on driving, since he didn't need his glasses except for reading. And so when he got home, he remembered that his glasses were on the seat beside him and he went to put them back in his pocket. He couldn't fit them in, they wouldn't go. Something was there. So he thought it was the rock that had been thrown at him that was still lodged in his pocket. He went to take it out, and what he found was not a rock, but a bullet. He was uninjured, of course. And he says it was Our Lady's scapula that saved his life. There are certainly many accounts, because we have a little book that called um, Stories of the Brown Scapular. It's a little book that in color, which I believe we have copies of it here, The Garment of Grace. Mike, you're right. It, it's, it's taken from a little book that was called Stories of the Scapular, but we've added to it, or others have added to it, and we've got a new book that called Garment of Grace, which refers to the Brown Scapular. And in there you'll see many accounts of miracles, of protection, miraculous protection. But protection extends more to the things such as a storm at sea that you'll read in there about a Anglican minister who was on his way to Australia. He and the, his, all fa his whole family were with him. And the ship ran into was I think called the Ocean King or the Ocean Queen. It was about 1838. And the ship ran into a storm. And it looked like the ship was going to go down. And um, there was on that same ship an Irish boy about 18 years old. He was one of the seamen and he wore a scapular. He came on deck, he took his scapular off, and then he threw it into the sea. And immediately, the storm was calmed. No more waves came over the ship, except for one. The one that brought his scapular back to his feet. The Anglican minister was so impressed that when he landed in Australia, he and his whole family took instructions in the faith and became Catholic. In 1957, I believe it was in Germany, there was a row of houses all attached to each other, row of houses, and one of them caught fire, and all of them in four hours burnt to the ground, all but one, one in the middle. On that house, 
The owner of the house had put a scamper on the front door and another scamper on the back door. The fire went over his house, it went around his house, but did not touch his house. So Our Lady has said that it would be a protection in danger, but I believe that ex ex protection extends even more. With the rise of Satanism in the world, there are many dangers that are not so visible. But nevertheless, Our Lady's protection doesn't only extend to physical dangers, but even dangers from the devil as well. So I would urge you to wear your scapular at all times, simply for that promise alone. But Our Lady goes much further than says that it would be a protection in danger. It's a sign of salvation and a pledge of peace. But above all, she tells us that those who die wearing the scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. This is a promise that has been endorsed by the church for over 700 years. Every pope since the year 1280 has himself worn the scapular of Mount Carmel. And if you listen to the prayer that the church gives, which I repeated from memory, which is in the Roman ritual, it goes, may she crush the serpent's head at the hour of your death and bring you to the, your crown of everlasting inheritance. That refers to both the vision of Elias and the, and the cloud, which was a symbol of Our Lady's foot crushing the serpent's head. It also refers to the promise Our Lady of Mount Carmel gives to all those who are enrolled in the scapular. By being enrolled in the scapular, you become a member of the Carmelite family and you have a right to wear the mantle of the Carmelites. And it's by wearing the mantle of Mount Carmel, you are putting yourself under Our Lady's colors and protection. In my licentiate thesis, I pointed out, and I didn't, my professor found nothing wrong with the reasoning, I wrote on the spirit of maternity of the Blessed Virgin. I believe the scapular also refers to the spi spirit of maternity of the Blessed Virgin. St. Louis de Montfort and St. Augustine both tell us that in this life, we are carried mystically in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, and that we are born of the Blessed Virgin, just as Jesus is born, just as we, are, we die with Jesus, and we rise with Jesus, as St. Paul says, so we are carried in the womb of Jesus, and we are born of the Blessed Virgin as well. We're carried in the womb of the Blessed Virgin like Jesus was, and we're born of the Blessed Virgin like Jesus was. And this is the spiritual birth, which I talked about a few days ago, which is also talked about by our Lord, unless a man be born again. And the Blessed and Second Vatican Council teaches us, and in the Latin, unlike the translations, which are often not accurate, in the Latin it says, the Blessed Virgin is called our mother because she generates us. And of course, she generates us who already pre-exist spiritually into the life of supernatural life of sanctifying grace. And the word used in Latin of that text is generavit. It is not like some of the so-called Fatima, or rather Vatican II experts tell us, Our Lady is our mother because she gives us a good example. Of course, she gives us a good example, but that is not the title to why she's called our mother. She's called our mother because she generates us into the life of sanctifying grace. And so by wearing the scapular, you symbolize that you're carried spiritually in the womb of the Blessed Virgin in this life. Because the scapular, the full mantle, of course, covers. And she is, when she gives the scapular, when she came at Fatima, she held, came dressed as Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the full length of the mantle, of course, covering her, including her womb. And this we are then, this symbolizes that. But I'd like to also point out to you what the Fathers of the Church point out from that same passage. I think it's St. Bonaventure who tells us that every passage, every page of the Old Testament talks to us of Our Lady. And just in that one passage about Elias and the cloud, that the doctors of the Church point out two other privileges of Our Lady with that. Not only is she the one to crush the serpent's head, but that her Immaculate Conception can be seen symbolically there. Remember, it was a salt water sea, but a fresh water cloud. And that arising out of sinful humanity represented by the salt water sea is the Blessed Virgin without any salt, without the stain of original sin or any traces of it. And also, Our Lady of Medrix of All Graces is seen there. And that is, it was from the one cloud that the, that the land that was parched and water often represents grace. And so it, the, the whole parched land of Israel, representing the, 
this land that needed grace received it all from the one cloud which was symbolized which symbolizes our lady and so when you think of a word like a great doctor of the church, St. Bonaventure, telling us that every page of the Old Testament talks about Our Lady, when you read with the wisdom and the insight they have, you can begin to get a little idea of what he's talking about. And that is why then uh, the Our Lady came to, to the Carmelites, because it was that order that was even started in sacred scripture, or the times of the Old Testament, the times of Elias, by one of the great prophets of the Old Testament, preparing for the coming of the Blessed Virgin. And it was to the Carmelites then, to the successor of Elias, to the superior general of the Carmelites in 1251, Our Lady gave this great promise. And, uh, and that is why Our Lady comes back at Fatima holding out the scapular to us. As Sister Lucy tells us, the rosary and the scapular are inseparable and that Our Lady wants us all to wear the scapular of Mount Carmel. And there's one particular grace that many people have experienced. It's not something that you will see a vision or that you'll feel anything, but I can speak from now some close to 35 years experience. I put my scapular back on. Most of us were enrolled perhaps at our first communion, but since I wasn't sure if that had been done, I asked the Carmelites there to enroll me in the scapular. Once you're enrolled, you're enrolled for life, but there's no harm if you happen to be enrolled again. That's by enrollment, by invest, being invested. That is a simple ceremony I just did. The, since I put on the scapular back in 1965, it was in March, near the Feast of the Annunciation, there's been, I think, less than half an hour I've been without wearing a scapular since that day. And a grace is given that I only noticed imperceptibly which is quite common for those who wear the scapular, and that is that if you wear the scapular, you find it much easier to pray five decades of the rosary every day. If you're faithful in wearing your scapular, you will find it that you pray the five decades of the rosary quite easily. And then by praying the rosary every day, you find your life changing in subtle ways, always for the better. And so the rosary is the... Um, the rosary and scapular are inseparable, and by wearing the scapular, you get the grace to pray the rosary every day. It makes it, Our Lady makes it even easier for you. John is just reminding me that he's hungry, more exactly, <laughs> that uh, it's time for dinner. I'll let uh, John then uh, conclude uh, this session here.